Hello, welcome back to the Pro Pilot Playbook Podcast, where we bring you yep. insights and information on how you can become a professional pilot in the fastest and cheapest means possible. I'm Sean, and we got- And uh, I'm Mike Martin. There we go. All right, <laughs> so, so today's podcast, you probably saw from the title, um, you know, how to buy, fly, and uh, <laughs> comply uh, <laughs> with, with buying, you know, uh, obtaining a jet. Right. And uh, it, it's not it's not quite the same as just uh, going to the car a lot and saying, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do that one. Uh, Mike, you just went through all of this as a corporate pilot, as corporate pilots, yep. both of us uh, being a corporate pilot can mean uh, that's a broad term. It can mean several things. It may just mean you're part of a large flight department. You're just a pilot and your job is much like an airline pilot. You're just wherever you're supposed to be at whatever time it is on your schedule. But uh, Mike and I, uh, as corporate pilots, do a little bit more than that. We are more aircraft managers that also fly the machines that we're managing. Right. And, uh, as an aircraft manager, Mike, you just went through your boss, uh, your guy just did a little upgrade, I hear. Yeah, yeah, sure did. And, and uh, yeah, it's my second run at this. I flew for another operator and we, we worked on a purchase of an airplane. But, but yeah, it's been exciting. It's been a long process. I learned a ton. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, so, you, you know, what we, uh, we, we operate a Learjet and uh, a Lear 40, which is a great aircraft, um, has about a three hour range. Um, you know, it, you can fit uh, seven people in it and uh, it's just it's a beautiful airplane, very sleek and, and nice. But um, the uh, business that I work for wanted to do uh, an upgrade to have a little bit longer legs. Uh, one of the one of the issues with a three hour range when you live in Cincinnati is you can't make the West coast without a fuel stop and you can't typically even make it back depending on how the winds are and stuff. And, uh, you, you know, you get into, uh, doing business on the West coast. Um, it, it takes almost an extra hour by the time you stop for fuel, connect the truck. Some airports are faster than the others. Everyone gets out, goes to the bathroom, uh, and then you climb back up, get back and cruise and all that. It can add a minimum of a half hour, sometimes, you know, an hour, depending on how quick it goes to, to each leg. So it's always preferable to go nonstop. A little bit different than going nonstop on the airlines. You know, it's not a connection. You're staying on the plane. But, um, right. um, yeah, yeah. And then there's also different performance. Larger airplanes in general when in the corporate jet world have greater performance. A lot of times, larger planes can get into smaller strips um than than um like the, the aircraft we bought's bigger but it actually has better runway numbers so um you, you know and you get in uh, climb gradients which is another whole another highly technical thing but basically uh when you're flying in the mountains and uh, you lose an engine you, your airplane needs to be able to complete the climb through the mountains and that affects how much weight you can take so if your company does a lot of uh, mountainous operations in and out of the rock pile we like to say it going to aspen tell you ride Eagle, um, you know, uh, uh, Lake Tahoe is an area uh, mountainous terrain. There's a lot of uh, uh, Park City, uh, Park City, Utah. There's a lot of uh, popular airports that a lot of people go in and out of a lot. And you may require greater thrust or a more expensive airplane uh, to get those things done. So it helps in a, in a number of ways, uh, not to mention that uh, larger airplanes are much more comfortable they, you know, the one that we bought has a full bathroom in it, you know, standing up, uh, you know, running water, all that stuff. So, um, and then the luggage compartments, huge, more luggage. I mean, it's just a lot better. So we upgraded. I think people, we, I, yeah. I, I just heard you say something back there. I think that uh, you kind of brushed over and said quickly that I think would surprise a lot of, uh, of, of aspiring pilots that are watching this that may already be a little bit through their training and, and have touched on some weight and balance and performance stuff. You actually right. said something that some of these modern, larger midsize or large cabin aircraft are actually have better performance numbers on short runways than, than the Learjet you were flying. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's, that's uh, crazy, I think right? that's, that's a, that's a pretty neat thing. Although a Learjet is a pretty high performance machine. It's, it's basically it the, the fighter jet version of, in the, of the corporate <laughs> jet. <laughs> yeah. Well, what you, what you got to think about if you're only carrying a couple people and, you, and you're not going as far, you're taking off with way less fuel than you would be, you know, if airplane has a seven hour range and you're only flying two hours, 
you might take off with a third of the gas where in a Learjet, if you're flying two hours, you might top off. So right. proportionally, you know, uh, there, there's a big thing. The other thing I want to touch on that's funny because I get this a lot from people that aren't in the business. They'll go, oh, um, you, 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 they ask you about seats on the plane when you say you got a bigger plane. Did you, right. you heard this? They're, they're like, oh, yeah, we sold our Premier. Uh, well, how many is that seat? Six. And we, oh, okay. And then uh, we bought a much bigger plane. And then you'll say, we bought a Challenger or a Gulfstream. And, and then it'll say, uh, oh, how many is that seat? Like 30? And you're like, no, it's still eight. <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's there's like a Lear, uh, a Lear 45 seats eight and a G, some, some larger, you know, Challengers or whatever. Sure. Are way bigger planes, but they still seat eight. So people think... Uh, an amateur thinks how you measure the size of the plane is by the seat capacity. Have you seen that? Sean? That is that is a huge thing. That is a, a really common question when you tell people you're a corporate <laughs> pilot, and uh, like, oh, so you fly with those little jets? How many people fit on that thing? That's usually the one of the first go-to questions. How many people? Does I think that it seems back from the airlines, right? When you want to, you, they always look at the seat capacity when sure. you think of a seven thirty-seven or a seven forty-seven. Right. Or, yeah. But uh, but with corporate jets, it's not like that. You get you get the bigger airplanes have way longer range and more comfortable cabins, but not necessarily more seats because most corporate missions you don't take more than eight or ten people ever. Most of the time, it's two to four people. So the seats get bigger. They're like lazy boys. They right. fly. Sometimes they have a couch on them. All that kind of stuff. So yep. um, so that we we researched the market and we ended up uh we stayed in the bombardier family and we bought a challenger 300 a used airplane um so uh the uh it's a it's a, it's called a super mid-sized jet so i i don't know if it's technically a large cabin but it's it's i mean it's thirty nine thousand pounds and it can fly for you know six plus hours so it's yeah. um it's it's a big deal and it's really sleek and nice looking um, the reason we chose that plane, several reasons. Number one, we've been operating Bombardier, and it was good to stay within the family. There's some commonality between how the airplanes are maintained and how they're flown. And then also, um, th this airframe, the, the Challenger 300 series, um, and several people have told me this, is it may go down as one of the most successful, if not the most successful, business jet airplane um, ever developed, and it's extremely popular. The reason why is they, um, uh, they, they're extremely reliable, um, and they fly really great. It's hard to find a mechanic, a pilot, or an owner that dislikes this plane. I mean, it's, it's very popular. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want to see what it is, Google it. It's a really good looking plane. I mean, it actually has a Learjet kind of look to it. Right. But so those of you watching this on YouTube, I, I've already put a, a picture of it up there for you. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, basically how plane shopping works is, uh, you, you, uh, you, you gotta figure out your mission and what you want to accomplish. That's the big thing. How many people do you typically fly and where do you typically go? And then you kind of build from there. Okay. Is our typical mission this, where do we go? And then you make sure that obviously what you're shopping for meets those needs. And then of course you've got budget. And if you're going new or used, uh, a lot of that, uh, the new or used thing, there's arguments, very strong arguments in both directions. Uh, sure. uh, there's a lot more value in used planes, but there can be higher maintenance costs. Uh, but then there's uh, depreciation from a tax standpoint is much higher on new planes. So a lot of big companies uh, uh, buy new because uh, they need that depreciation. Um, right. and that's but that depreciation thing. in most cases and the tax benefits may not apply to a private wealthy individual that's just using it right. to fly back and forth from his homes uh, right, right. spread across the country so that that plays <laughs> into the equation the big joke is public companies waste money so they buy all new airplanes private <laughs> companies use them by use but that, that's not 100 percent true but that is what you find a lot you know it's yeah. the shareholders money not yours so why not get a new one right <laughs> but uh right. so we uh so what you do you identify the plane you want and then you know there's there's a company so there's a it's called cocklet and decker i think you might have heard of it but they they uh they'll you can compare airplanes they have all the performance data range numbers but the, more importantly they have operating costs because uh different airplanes have much higher operating costs depending on the maintenance history on those planes the maintenance intervals on those planes and then their overall reliability and those those units are available obviously bigger planes burn more fuel 
Uh, the parts are more money. The pilots need to make more. So you need to make sure your budget all meets that. Once you've identified all that and you say, okay, what we want is a challenger, or what we want is a Lear, or what we want is a citation, then you, you, it's time to go shopping. Um, and there's several ways you can hire a broker that can represent you as a buyer and find that. Um, we did kind of a hybrid. We looked for the plane ourselves. And uh, there's a website, it's kind of to use a uh, real estate thing. Uh, uh, Zillow is kind of a nationwide website where you look for houses. There's one called Controller. Um, and it used to be called Executive Controller, but there's a, a controller. It used to be a magazine. Now it's a website. And they have almost all the listings in the world for private debt. So you can go on that controller.com. You could say, I'm looking for this vintage of an airplane, you know, this many seats, whatever, and it'll show all the hits. And you can call all the brokers. <laughs> the problem is, <laughs> here's the funny thing, Sean, and you know, I know you know this, there's no prices. Hardly any of them ever right. have any prices. And, you know, yeah. it's the old adage, if you have to ask, uh, um, you, <laughs> right. you, you, you can't, can't afford, afford it. it. Or, uh, but, <laughs> or yeah, right. it's going to be high. <laughs> But in, in the thing is, it's so technical, uh, even when you you got to really know these planes to know what the price is, because even yep. on a one model, you know, so, so ours is a big thing. It's not like a car, like a car. You're like, well, I want a uh, 2010 Honda Accord. And, you know, based on the miles, it should be about 12, 12 grand or something, plus or minus however many miles. Well, in you, airplanes, you might think it might be the same thing. OK, well, we'll. Uh, uh, We'll find one and, it, you know, they're going to be about 10 million plus or minus the hours. Doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, could be the maintenance inspections. When is uh, there's like on these on these Bombardier products, every every 96 months, there's a uh, huge inspection um, that that could cost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not close to a million dollars, depending on what they find wrong with it. If you have an airplane that's older, but it's through that inspection, it's worth more. If you have it coming up on one of those, it's worth less. Uh, uh, right. the, uh, the trim levels on these planes, incredible. And I'm not talking about soft goods like the cabin and things like that, which that stuff's expensive too, interior refurbs, but there's different avionics packages, different upgrades, GPS systems that it could have on it. Uh, it could have upgrades to the screens, and, and, and these can be millions. Literally, there is, if you take like a classic Challenger 300 versus a Challenger 350 that's a late model, if you wanted to upgrade that old 300 to the new one for all the international standards and everything, it could be over a million dollars. Um, you, you could have Wi-Fi in your plane. Some of them have Wi-Fi, some of them don't. Wi-Fi right. is $200,000 to install if you have the new sure. one, but is it, is it the L5 or is it the L3 or is it, I know all about that shit too, by the way, but and I've talked <laughs> to you about that off camera, but, but uh, 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 some of them uh, are super slow. You can't use them. So the broker will tell you, Oh, it has Wi-Fi. Well, it's like the slowest thing you could, uh, but if you have the new, uh, you know, greatest and best, it's like almost you can stream stuff like right. and it's a huge difference. And it's also $5,000 a month. Right. charge. So you got to look at, you know, do you want to pay that? You know, I, yeah, so, I just uh, went through that with one of my guys uh, flew on somebody else's jet. Oh, yeah, this Wi-Fi Wi-Fi in here was amazing. My kids are watching movies. I'm doing this yeah. I'm doing that. And then he goes yeah. to get it for his airplane. Of course, he cheaps out and gets the cheapest thing possible. <laughs> and uh, the only thing like he can do is send and receive email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you got to know all that stuff, you know, and it's something you learn. So it was a long process. This was almost two years of, of identifying the plane that we wanted and then researching the used one so we could find the exact right fit. Um, and, and that all comes down to price. So, um, you know, you want to know your market, then you find them. Then when you find the airframe that you want, you have to negotiate on price. And that's all based on how, just like a, a house or something, how long it's been on the market, how many people have used uh, you know, the demand for that particular airplane, then you got to negotiate a closing date. And then you have the pre-buy. Now the pre-buy is like a home inspection on a house uh, where you bring it to a maintenance facility. Typically it's the one that doesn't typically do maintenance on that. And it's usually a large reputable maintenance facility like Duncan or Bombardier or one of these, uh, the manufacturer, one of these huge maintenance facilities. And they can do a basic walk around and the buyer pays for this, or they could do one, like basically take the whole airplane apart and put it back together again and tell you right. everything that's wrong with it. Um, they can borescope the engines, all that stuff. 
And then you, uh, they tell you, you decide the level of that, and we won't get into all of that that you want to do. But and then uh, you, they come up with a list of all the crap wrong with the plane, and then you argue with the seller, and they and they usually have their team of mechanics to say, no, that's not really wrong. It's acceptable. You argue over that. You can settle it with money. You can settle it and have them fix it. And then once all that's done, then you actually have the closing like a house and then you, you on the plane. And then there's all the setup with the airplane because now you got to get all right. these authorizations for the FAA. You got to get trained in the plane to fly it. You it isn't as easy as just going to the, uh, going to the oh. DMV your driver's license branch oh. and getting some new <laughs> license plates. Oh, no. <laughs> in the subscriptions, as you know, Sean, I mean, oh, yeah. all these data packages and charts yes. and manuals and it is a big, big freaking deal but you know it's fun and and uh we're excited we're upgrading the plane i guess if you were downgrading the plane you were doing all that work it'd be not as exciting but uh i'm excited to fly a bigger faster better looking airplane you know so so it's all been good um, so that's so, that's the uh getting getting the machine and and getting the machine ready and right. and uh of course you kind of you kind of just brushed over all of the uh, stuff it takes after it's actually on your property. <laughs> I that right. that's always a nightmare because every time I think I've got it all done, all right. So I changed the end number on him for him. That was a nightmare. Yeah. I got got the new insurance in place. I got got all the subscriptions, whatever. I got this registered. The uh, the all the beacon codes and everything's been restrapped and re moved in our name. Whatever. Every time I think I got it all done somebody reminds me of like two other things that I didn't even know existed. And uh, yeah, I start all over with that, that, but that's just airplane stuff. Uh, yes. You just got back from, you know, uh, some, <laughs> some, some pilots consider, uh, you know, the most intense type of uh, training they go through. And uh, that's the initial type rating. For, the, for this airplane every jet a lot of people don't may not realize this every jet that you see flying over your house requires a specific license just for that aircraft uh, yep. you know of course you have to have all your pilot certificates all your pilot's licenses and stuff but these machines are so complex and complicated the faa has they issue a specific license just for that particular machine and it will go on the back of your pilot's license on the back of your little yep. card uh, forever yeah, forever. You were licensed to fly that jet. Mike, you just got back from this uh, initial type yeah. school for the Challenger 300. How long does that take to get done? And you give us a uh, walk through what, what's all entailed there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so you, you have to, it, I think it's in the airplane over 12,500 pounds it requires a license to fly. And you have to go to a certified training center that, that does that. Um, you can actually receive, and this would be the first thing people watching would come to mind you can actually receive training in the airplane uh by a certified instructor to get that and pass a check ride but no one does that and the reason why is the airplane's just too expensive and you can't get the level of training in a plane because you can't catch it on fire and fly through thunderstorms that you can in a uh, in a in a uh, simulator yep. so you have to go to one of these simulator training facilities and it's a big freaking deal um, um, so the two major players in doing that are uh, Flight Safety, which Warren Buffett owns, a uh, big company, um, and Flight Safety International, and then CAE, it used to be called CAE Simuflight, but they're the two major players. Um, between those two companies, they cover most airplanes, um, and uh, uh, I went to CAE Dallas, uh, which they have several locations, but the, the CAE Dallas facility at DFW Airport is the largest single site uh, aviation training facility in the world. I think there's 30 next to hard eight barbecue. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> in the great, great town of Dallas, which everyone loves. Uh, 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 Dallas is a great place to train because you have uh, uh, lots of availability for flights. The hotels are wonderful. The food is wonderful. Texas is a great state as a lot of you know that are coming, coming through. So it is a great place and the weather's good. Um, yeah, everything's bigger there. The yeah, yeah, you're right. So this facility uh, that CAE has there in Dallas is probably, uh, I don't know, it's a huge building, has 30 of these plus, 30 plus of these uh, full motion, they call them level D simulators that are on hydraulic stands and uh, uh, the YouTube video, well, I'm sure you'll put some pictures of what these, yeah, what yeah. these, yeah. Yeah, these simulators look like, but uh, 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 I'll let you touch on, Sean, t t tell them 
explain to them these simulators and how real they are. You yeah, know? you know, I've I've told this same story over the years several several times. I don't think the average person realizes, you know, the level of complexity these things have, especially now as we're moving into this, uh, you know, world of all the GPS and stuff. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure what version of SIM uh, they have different levels, uh, ABC and uh, up to D, but now that we're into the level D simulator, which just means whether it's motion or not motion or whether it's nighttime or daytime simulation, the level D simulator does everything. But within the level D sims now, they have all these other little things that really as a pilot, we don't even know. It's more for them technically. The, the levels are FAA certification type things. But right. what I'm talking about is whether or not they're attached to uh, a satellite mapping, for instance, if I fly over my hometown in this simulator, the golf courses, the cemeteries, it's all there, real-time, photorealistic stuff. And the, the, the motion on these things, uh, you know, when you, when you push the thrust levers up on the ground, uh, what's actually happening outside the simulator, you know, in this, this tiny bubble you're on on these jack stands, it, in, you're sitting here facing this way it rolls back like this. So you're sitting on your back. So you get the feeling, the sensation of accelerating down the runway as you push those. And if you mash on the brakes, the whole thing tilts this way. Now you're up in your seat belts, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. feeling like you're decelerating. So, and, and all that's going on the entire time the air, that's not just driving around the ground, the entire time the airplane's in the air, the simulator's in the air, all that stuff is happening. And it's very realistic. I, I used to joke, that if we put the maybe not in daytime mode because there are limitations to what these the graphic screens that you're looking at you know whatever 1080p resolution they are or whatnot um but all if i put the simulator in night mode and blindfolded you and told you you were going on an airplane ride um, yeah i think i could fool a good a good percentage of the population at least for a few minutes that they whether or not oh, yeah. they're in an airplane or not and it's not just the visuals and the motion there's other things happening too the the noises that are associated audio. with this yeah the audio you know the surround sound speakers uh that are going on it's the real cockpit too yeah it, I mean, it, yeah this is not airplane. a mock this is exactly these are all yeah. the actual components uh built to look exactly like what's in the airplane or actually from the real airplane installed in this in this thing it's uh it's the greatest computer simulation game ever built <laughs> i know i know there's some people watching this like that sounds awesome uh, it and it is fun it is fun um the training is so intense you know it's 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 not fun sometimes but i will tell you that the <laughs> I, to put it bluntly but i will tell you that the uh uh it screws with your mind I mean, you know, you're usually training at night because that's when it's hardest to fly or the visual cues are less. And you're, you're in, in this box and, and it, the, the simulator room actually has all windows. And you come out of there and you're like, oh, my God, you, you think it's dark out. And then they open the door and you come out and you see the sunshine. You're like, oh, what? And your mind has to reset. I can remember this, Sean. I don't know if I told you this, but I was at Flight Safety Tucson uh, doing some training. And it was cold weather day. And yeah. it was like 197. Like the visual, the visuals something. on the snow, uh, you know, in yeah. the simulator. That's that's another thing. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. You, you, I just spent all day doing takeoffs and landings in a, on a snowy day at Aspen. And you open up the door of the simulator and it's lunchtime and the sun's shining through. And like, <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? Yeah. So so I was in Tucson uh, and it was in the summer. And it, they have a training center there, flight safety. And it was like. 197 degrees or something there so i got on like a short sleeve shirt shorts you know uh and then we go in and it's cold weather day and i i and it's snowing and we're de-icing and your mind is so screwed up i was absolutely freezing you know because of the way yeah. i was I'm like oh my god why am i dressed like this in the winter <laughs> so you know it, it screws with you you know and if you get in a bad way i mean if they give you some of these failures and things that uh you know some things you can't recover from you, you for a minute you feel like you're gonna die you know because you actually think you're flying so it's uh it's it's very intense but let's let, yeah let's talk about the program and it is it is a fun thing i mean i've got six type ratings so so by the time you do it as much as i have um it's not that stressful 
uh, but it is very expensive and the stakes are very high. If you need extra training, your employer knows about it. It's very expensive. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you, of course, could not make it through. I mean, there is a possibility it does happen. So, um, and the testing is very hard and very strict. So yep. there is a lot of pressure, you know, and they, they, they prepare you, but they don't over-prepare you because no one has time to over-prepare. It's too expensive. Everything's in too much high demand. So you got to do a lot of studying on your own to make this happen. So it is, is very stressful. But I'll give you an idea of how the program is structured. Um, so, uh, the program is about two and a half weeks long. Um, you don't come home. I mean, you just go down there and you're gone. Yep. Um, they can be as, I think the global program and the Gulfstream program could be a full month. Um, some of the smaller citations might only be two, two weeks or 10 days, but I would say on average, you're looking at three weeks or so, um, uh, to get these. So you go down there the night before, uh, check in the hotel, uh, and then you, you make sure you're in class at eight in the morning. So we had class every day from eight to five. Um, and uh, Eight to the five first, for two and a half weeks. Right. And the, uh, the first half of the training is all ground school. Um, and what they do is uh, they teach you basically the systems on the plane. So I brought some of the course materials just to show people. Now okay, some of this good. is electronic on that end, but, but nice. uh, uh, these aren't even all the manuals. This is the Challenger 604 that I got to type right. This is the manual just for the FMS, the flight management system. So you can see this is this is pretty thick here. That's just it. the computer these are all, we use in the airplane for our flight. Yep. Stuff. Yep. yep. These are all on your desk when you get there. Here's your yeah. uh, flight training guide. I can't even pick it up with one hand. This is <laughs> these are what these manuals. This is the uh, the Bombardier uh, pilot training guide. So what this yeah. has in it, uh, it's about a thousand pages. You can see. All I remember this Bombardier box. always had that. Bombardier always has the nicest manuals. Those those oh, man. uh, faux leather bound uh, padded binders yes. and oh, it's yeah, first yeah. Class, man. Uh, like here's a description of the APU and the engine and how the engine flow works. So there's uh, electrical communications, flight instruments, flight controls. They all have a section in here. And now if you're into airplanes, which we all are and everybody wants it, it's kind of cool. I mean, some of you guys, if I gave you this manual, you'd look at it for free. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fun, but it's just an absolute fire hose. I had a guy tell me, John, you'll like this, uh, uh, that it's like four years of college in three weeks. <laughs> so I, I would enough. imagine some people, some people, it feels like that. I've been through, you know, a couple of initials uh before that uh, i could see people that were not getting it and they were struggling it is a lot of information for yes. to be able to take on in, in a short amount of time yeah drinking this from is, the fire hose is the uh yes that's it the fire hose that's exactly yeah. it. this is the uh challenger 604 uh uh quick reference manual so they call it the qrh quick reference handbook this is actually in the cockpit with you but what this is what you do on a lot of your flight training so the red tab items are emergencies that occur and you can look up if you have uh what they call a cast message but basically a light that comes on like for instance it says wing overheat uh that's an emergency procedure so you would pull this thing out and then uh uh, uh then it tells you the procedures in flight of what to do so the airplane tells you what's wrong and then you fall you pull this thing out and you do what it has then it's got the yellow ones or amber they call them these are things that aren't as big of an emergency, like your engine fire, engine failure, all that's in red, depressurization, yeah. and then, you know, you lose a generator or something that's in the yellow. So uh, that's a lot of your training. So you, oh, you, so you do that for a week, the school part, and then you get into the sim. And when you get into the hardcore simulator training, um, they, 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 they usually have these mock-ups uh, and they give you this. This is kind of interesting. This is a, the cockpit art. This is actually for the Challenger 300. Oh yeah, this would be good. So, yeah, yeah, this is good. So this is a full mock-up of the cockpit and every switch and every button. And you can sit in your hotel at night and you can run through these checklists because, I mean, it really takes a long time. Like, you know, there might be 50, 60 items on, on one checklist to get the airplane ready to fly. And you jump in that simulator at, you know, however many thousands of dollars an hour, and that's not an exaggeration. And you know where buttons are? Uh, you're eating up a lot of your time, you know, right. so you don't want to go. It'll say a parking brake set. And then you're like looking, where, where the hell's the parking brake? Oh, oh, okay. It's right here. And then you said, it. if you do that on hundred items, <laughs> it'll take you 45 <laughs> minutes, right? So right. you gotta, you gotta get that thing out and you gotta go through the checks and go, okay, it's here. Here's where this is. The overhead switches are here. That's what's on the top. Hydraulics, all that stuff. 
Um, so and the other thing is with those cockpit posters, the other thing they're good for in that situation when you're doing the initial one of these jets, most of all the jets have the same systems, but the switches, buttons, labels, rotary dials, they could, that particular manufacturer could call that system something else or label things differently, or some right. jets just have other systems the other ones don't. So it's always good. You can run your finger around that cockpit poster and be like, what does this switch do? And be able to recall yeah. it instantly or just close yeah. your eyes and point to one. And uh, yeah, and be able to rattle off what that thing does, what system is connected to, how that system works, you know, because that's kind of, that's a check right question right there. That's yeah. stereotypical. Oh, yeah textbook yep. check right yep so then you get into the training and uh the, basically there's like six sims and then your check ride and each simulator session it's it's two pilots so one pilot pilot flies for two hours the other pilot does the co-pilot duties then you get out take a break switch seats and then the other guy flies for two hours and the other guy and then the other guy sits in the right seat so um what, one of you is, so one of you is flying while the other one's uh, pilot not flying four. duties and then you swap on it and yeah exactly for four hours total and you do that right. six times uh, and there's a briefing and a debriefing after each simulator event and uh, the first one's pretty normal I mean it's just getting to know the plane and doing takeoffs and landings and uh, maneuvers and things like that um, but then after that it's all over right Sean <laughs> then, then, yeah. then it's like okay you can fly it you can land it day one then it's like, uh, okay, the engine's on fire. What the right. hell are we doing? You get in all then your abnormals, on... emergencies. Oh, yeah. You have a high, hot, and heavy day performance. You have your yeah. cold day performance. Cold weather ops. And yeah. when I say performance, I mean how the airplane handles basically on one engine. So every time you take off from that point on after day one of the normal day, yeah. uh, every time you take off, you're losing an engine something's catching on fire. There's a hydraulic pump that's stopping. Uh, your, your instrument panels flickering and goes out. Um, yep. you know, if, if you're at the airlines, they're going to pretend that a flight attendant's running into the cockpit saying there's a passenger in the back, whatever, after they just failed an engine on you. And now the flight yep. attendant's freaking out that there's a passenger having a heart attack. You know what it is? So, uh, this is kind of stuff you, uh, deal with. And yeah, I remember, actually, it was in flight safety. They had a smoke machine. And actually, oh, they yeah, yeah. The they they put smoke fire. in a cockpit. You yeah, so smoke put, goggles yeah, on. Yeah, you got to put the mask in uh, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you do all that for the five sims, and you do a warm-up for your check ride, and then you get to your actual type rating, uh, type ride. Um, uh, um, and that that is a, about two and a half hour flight, followed by another two and a half hours of support of the other guy. Um, and you start the day off with an oral exam. And uh, basically, it's a guy and you and another guy in a room, and he can ask you anything he wants about the plane, and you need to answer it with greater than like 80% <laughs> uh, right. uh, to get it. Um, there's a lot of different formats. Uh, uh, there is a ton of memorization, and if you're good at that, you will do well on the oral. But basically, you have to memorize all the weights with the airplane. Uh, you know, what's the max takeoff weight? What's the max landing weight? What's the max fuel? Yeah, how much fuel does it take? How much thrust do the engines have? What is the oil pressure PSI? All, all these limitations of the plane because the reason that's important is you can exceed them when you're flying. For instance, in this airplane, you have to be going slower than 250 knots to put the gear down or you bend the gear. That's an important number for a pilot to know. <laughs> you don't want them to throw the gear down and bend the, bend the landing gear. Uh, different speeds on the flaps, what they can come down. So you have to memorize. There's probably a hundred things that you have to memorize. And it sounds hard, but there's flashcards. And now they had a digital yep. way here. This is the first time here. Yeah, digital all the iPad cards. apps and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And then you have to have a basic knowledge of each system. So they'll talk to you about what happens when you lose your right hydraulic pump, you know, what, 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 what takes over and all that stuff. Um, there's also a written test. The written test is done in class though. That's not on check ride day. Um, right. then you get, get in the actual simulator. Um, and, uh, lucky me, I was, uh, selected one of the, uh, every six months, one student out of thousands, uh, for an FAA observation. So I had the, uh, the feds on the check ride, uh, the federales. Uh, right. So instead of having, instead of having a designated pilot examiner, uh, on your ride, you had the FAA guy who was observing your designated pilot examiner who was observing you. So yes. there was it's just extra pressure. Yeah, yeah, extra pressure. 
Exactly. Yeah, I've I've had that same thing happen to me before. It's not. Oh man. Yeah, it, just knowing that extra layer of is back there is just yeah. It's yep. yeah. It can mess yep. with you. It can mess with you. So this yes. is the initial type ride, and this is the one that gives you the license for that jet. Yep. However, the simulator thing is is something that pilots are doing all the time. In in Mike and I's world of corporate pilots. Uh, we are having to do this every year. Every year we go through this. At the airlines, as a captain, at the airlines, you'll do this every, or a charter operation, you will do this every six months. Not the initial, that one's called a recurrent. So, recurrent, yep. Yep, so you go back for, it depends on the airplane and, and whether it's a 135 or a charter ride or a corporate, it could be anywhere from two to three days uh, of of short classroom five days. what's that yeah. uh the recurrence we were doing five days two classrooms and then three okay six. so yeah. all right yeah so the, the recurrent for the uh for the, for the 135 guys because mike you have mike does yeah. you know his corporate yeah. he's he flies under 135 yeah. certificate on on the side um so five days yeah mine's three days my 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 recurrence three days part oh you mine. gotta be easy man you gotta yeah be easy. yeah it yeah. still ends up um, being five days with the travel and and whatnot i but right yeah it's three days so they do a two-day recurrent of ground school so they go through all the systems two days eight hours a day and then you do two warm-ups and then you do your check ride um so it's, you're there monday through friday um, gotcha yeah, yeah, we do that every six months. Uh, and, you know, it depends on your insurance company, too. They can have different requirements, you know, depending on, on what. Um, uh, uh, and then you could do, be dual qualified to airplanes. Like, by me taking this Challenger test, it made me current again in the Lear. So that was helpful, you know. But, yeah, it's an exciting world. Uh, the good news about it is you have that license forever, like we mentioned earlier in this film. Um, and somebody else pays for it. Your employer pays for it. Um, and uh, it makes you more marketable for obvious reasons, because if you are now hired by like, so I have six type ratings, uh, any employer that has any of those six airplanes, if they hire me, they don't have to pay to train me because I'm already, right. yep. I'm already in the training is just let's leave yep. it at this very expensive. That's actually a good point. <laughs> you didn't mention, we didn't mention that, you know, so what's the initial type rating on the Challenger 300 cost? Uh, I don't want to get into specifics because that's all negotiated, but I would say in general, uh, business jet type ratings vary be between 20 and 70,000. Um, right. And the, yeah, and so the, uh, I can, I can the, tell you with exact the, the premier jet, which is the airplane I specialize in, there's only one yeah. simulator left on the planet and one okay. company that owns that simulator. And <laughs> They have no competition. There's is no negotiation. <laughs> so it's a straight, it's, it's a $30,000 type rating. Initial type ratings, 30 K. Mm -hmm. And then um, every year it's uh, uh, this part is negotiable. It's usually between nine and 12 grand for your recurrent. Yeah. Yeah. Those numbers are higher uh, on the challenger because it's more expensive playing. Um, and then those top end numbers I'm talking about when you start approaching to the 70 grand mark, that's, the very expensive airplanes like global expresses and right. golf streams, uh, they can be high, but you know, your employer pays for that, but you get the license. Um, um, some employers want a contract to, you know, if they're going to pay for this. You're going to stay there a year or two or X amount, which is definitely understandable. No, it's a, it's a real bad thing in the industry. If your employer pays for something like this and then you quit, you know, yeah, for a better job, leave. that's right. Yeah, that's not good. Um, and, and most people hiring you don't like to see that either. But um, uh, but yeah, and then it, it, uh, so if anything ever happened to my job, I can, you know, all this stuff with coronavirus, you get laid off or whatever. You can solicit companies that have airplanes that you're typed with and then you're turnkey for them. You can just come right in and maybe they have to send you to a recurrent if it's been a couple of years. But uh, you might already be current, you know, in their plane. So it makes you highly desirable. So it's good. And, you know, Sean, anytime you go through something like that, it makes you a better pilot. So it's oh, yeah, absolutely. good all around. You know? I mean, and, and you're in there. Is, there's also another thing that happens. Uh, you're not going through this class by yourself. You know, there's, there's right. other people in that initial uh, other pilots right where you're at going through that initial or recurrent and you're getting to connect with other people yeah. out there in that in that uh challenger community or the premier community whatever jet you're on you know yeah, that, yeah. there's a lot of value in that you're exchanging business cards you know uh 
you know, oh, yeah. typical conversations with pilots are always something to do with cars, women, boats, uh, money, <laughs> or, or jobs, schedules, you know, so you get to know guys and you got them in your, in your call, right? In your, in your speed dial. So if something happens to your job, you're calling them up and it's a great networking opportunity is what I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, man, and you meet some characters. I mean, people from all over the world. I can remember this guy that was in my Lear 60 class, and uh, he was flying a Learjet for the – he's a Russian, and he was flying a Learjet for yeah. – for, sounds like the Russian mob or something. Yeah. So everybody asked, you know, oh, who do you fly for and what do you do or whatever? And he, he's like, I fly for an owner. And uh, and we're like, oh, I like what, what kind of what kind of business is your, your owner? And he's like, oil, gold diamonds in real estate <laughs> okay that sounds pretty intense <laughs> so i can remember we were on a break and he was talking to this other pilot about what he does and in, in, in u.s pilot uh uh and in, in kind of recruiting him like hey would you have interest in moving to russia and all this stuff and the guy seemed quite interested because the pay at that time was was really good you know uh, uh so the instructors over here in the conversation he's like oh just to let you know that wouldn't work because he has all FAA licenses and Russia's uh, JAA and there's a conversion and all this stuff. Right. And I remember the Russian pilot just sticks up his head. He's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. He goes, uh, my boss is very, very, very wealthy and very, very, very Russian. If he wants him, <laughs> he gets him. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I've had uh, uh, all kinds Yeah, these of people fun. come from all over the world to these training yeah. centers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, yeah, because he's, there's not a lot of training on, uh, I think I, I want to, what I, 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 have you seen this stat, uh, Sean, but it's like real high, like 80% of the business jets in the world are in the United States. I mean, it's a staggering, uh, number. Um, so most I, of the yeah, people, I don't know. I believe it though. That's probably, yeah. Yeah. Worldwide come to the U S for training. So yeah, you meet some real characters. <laughs> Well, I initially started laughing when you said that meeting characters. It my mind flashed back. I don't even know if I should be saying this on this podcast. But my <laughs> mind, my mind flashed back to when we were both in uh, 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 initial for Lear. Th this is going back. What is like 15, 18 years ago? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that yeah. Lear thirty five and that character showed up driving that that eight axle or that four axle uh, crane truck. I know. If you drove it all the way from Idaho to Texas, this is like a industrial vehicle you would only leave on a job site. And this guy drives it halfway across the country to go fly. If you get a type rating in a jet, he just had some extra money, I guess. To get a type rating in a jet without even having a job, he just paid for himself. Now that you say that, I remember that guy. Now that's a character. Really <laughs> that's character. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you have uh, wealthy people too that buy the jet and then they go through the school. And uh, actually, my instructor was just talking about this. It, probably very popular in the career, but uh, you know, there's a certain personality of those, the people that get the to that owner, level operator. of business. Yeah. Oh yeah, and they can be a bear, man, in, in training. You know, because they're used to being in charge, and yeah, that's just the way it is. But but right. it is an exciting part of the business. Not a lot of people know about. Um, so I hope you've got value from this video, uh, just learning what it is like. Type ratings are required for airliners also, if you're PIC in the, in the, in airlines. So, but that training is all done in house, but it's very similar to what we're saying. Um, in, in, in fact, it may be even better in the airlines, maybe even more intense or longer. Uh, but they do the same type of thing in order you can get a type rating 737, 767, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's just an interesting aspect of the business. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you ever were wondering, acquiring a private jet, how that went, I hope you learned something. Also, uh, the same thing applies if you want to buy a personal plane, which I think we're going to do another video about, uh, personal yep. aircraft and flight training and stuff. So, uh, glad to get back in the, uh, saddle, so to speak, and get some of these videos done. So yeah, yep. thanks for watching. Yep. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we're, we're going to be posting these more regularly. And again, check out our, uh, our stuff at propilotplaybook.com. If you want to send us a question that we will, we will answer for you here on the podcast, you can send that to podcast at propilotplaybook.com. But until uh, next time, take care. See ya.